There is no doubt that the 2012 anime adaptation of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure skyrocketed the series outside of Japan, but that is not to say that JoJo's didn't have an important presence before that. In terms of official media, there wasn't much. They tried releasing the part free manga in English in 2005, and there was even a dub of the Stardust Crusaders OVA series. But what I think is the most iconic is the Capcom fighting game commonly known as Heritage for the Future. If you were on the internet in mid to late 2000s, you probably remember at some point seeing the sprites of Dio and his road roller accompanied by the iconic voice lines or one of the many edits made out of it. <laughs> Those early memes were annoyingly also my first experience with the JoJo series, but it wouldn't be till much later where I understood their origins and became a fan of the series myself. Not being a huge fighting games player, I never went further than just reading about the game and watching videos online, but did appreciate the attention to detail it had and all the fan service they've added that expands on the world of part 3. That's all in addition to being an actually really solid game. I've pretty much only heard positive things about it and to this day it is played online. Made in the prime years of Capcom, this was more than a cheap cash in. Whilst it may not be the most balancing out there, it's still an incredibly fun experience. In this video I'll be focusing on the PS1 version of the game, but let's quickly go over all the versions of the game that exists, as it can be quite confusing. Starting with the original arcade release of the game, JoJo's Venture, released on December 2nd, 1998. It was made for the CPS Free Arcade Board system, which was the last proprietary system Capcom made, and would feature several versions of Street Fighter 3 also developed for it. It's a fairly standard version of the game, containing a versus mode where you can fight against another player and a pretty basic story mode for each of the playable characters. This version of the game has been mostly dropped in favor of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Heritage for the Future, released on September 13th, 1999, also for the CPS Free Board system. This is an updated version of JoJo's Venture, featuring new characters and moves, and rebalancing amongst other things. In addition to that, a new single player challenge mode has been added, where you do a series of fights where your HP and super bars get carried over each fight, with the option to heal slightly or gain meter after each victory. The AI in these fights is a lot more challenging as well. So those were the two main arcade versions of the game. They were both later ported to the Dreamcast under the title JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Heritage for the Future, released originally on October 31st, 1999. This straight up just contains both versions of the arcade games, which you can pick at the start. A year later, on October 26, 2000, Heritage for the Future of a matching service was released which added online to the Dreamcast game. Then, on August 21, 2012, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure HD came out on PSN and Xbox Live Arcade, which contained only the Heritage for the Future port, so no JoJo's Venture, but it had an updated online mode that supported 8 players. Unfortunately, that version got taken down already, so you can't buy it anymore. And finally, we come to the main version that we will be looking at in this video. Called simply JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and released on the PS1 originally on October 14, 1999, this version is a bit different as at its core it's a port of the JoJo's Venture arcade game with some elements of heritage for the future implemented, but being on the PS1 instead of an arcade or even a Dreamcast means it's a bit more clunky and has worse graphics. However, it makes up for that with a variety of extra modes and a proper story mode with minigames. This game would introduce several mechanics which would be seen in most future JoJo games, such as secret factors for following events of the manga and acquiring points for rankings to unlock bonus content. Let's not waste any more time and start with the Super Story Mode. Spoilers for part 3 obviously. We get into a little cutscene and are told of a 100 year old coffin that was found off the coast of Africa. Then we cut to a prison cell with Jotaro claiming he's been possessed by a demon and Abdul blowing up the bars, which leads us into our first fight. As this is a PS1 game, there is a lot of long loading screens, but you get to see a lot of random pieces of artwork which is nice. Before each fight, you get shown inputs for a few of your moves. The A here just means an attack button. You move around with the D-pad, where holding back makes you guard. Your square, triangle and circle buttons are your light, medium and heavy attacks respectively. The shoulder buttons all correspond to different multiple attack inputs. L1 is triangle and circle, L2 is square and circle, R2 is square and triangle, and R1 is all free attack buttons. The first free, or pressing two attack buttons, will also let you do a safe fall when hit. With R1, or all attack buttons, you perform a sort of a dash, which has invincibility, or if used while blocking, will push the opponent away. You can throw opponents by walking towards them and using the heavy attack. Doing a quarter circle forward input plus attack, the moment you block, will let you do a guard cancel counter attack. The X button is used to activate your stand. Some characters don't have a stand they can activate and X just becomes another attack. Without your stand, blocking attacks will still deal chip damage, but with the stand out, the stand gauge drains instead. If it breaks completely, you will get stand crushed and take damage, allowing the opponent to get in more hits as well. You can recharge the stand gauge by turning off your stand. Having your stand out will allow you to do a double jump, as well as changing your normal attacks. Some special and super attacks can also be performed only with your stand on or off, or have different properties. 
Doing a quarter circle backwards with at least one level of special meter will do a tandem attack. You'll be able to press different attack buttons to program your stand, after which it will shoot forward and perform the program move. You can then join in to perform extra hits yourself with your stand out. Note that not all characters are able to do this. I won't be going over every character's moveset besides some of Jotaro's as you play the most as him. I will be mentioning some moves of characters you play as and any interesting ones the opponents might have as Capcom did a great job recreating these characters in a fighting game setting, but even then I won't be mentioning the inputs much after this. Quarter circle forward does the aura punch barrage, quarter circle backwards does a powerful strike forward and the Z input does a star finger. Super moves, which consume your super meter, most often involve a quarter circle input followed by two attack buttons. For example, quarter circle forward with two attack buttons does a more powerful aura barrage. If you do it with your stand off, it will go up by itself and you will be free to move yourself. Quarter circle backwards does a strong punch which actually has quite a bit of range. There is one more special move he can do by inputting forward, medium attack, light attack, forward and the stand button, but we'll get to that one much later. And lastly, but definitely most importantly, select is your taunt. That's pretty much it for the basics of the game. There's a lot to the individual characters themselves and it can be easily seen a lot of work has been put into it, so if this game looks interesting to you, I recommend playing it and experimenting yourself. We proceed with the fight with Avdol. The story mode fights are always one round, so we finish them pretty quickly and get to the ranking screen. You just can't have an anime game without one. The things you're ranked on are your health, time taken, special actions, which is a set of random things like being the first one to get a hit in, performing throws, not using your stand, or having no meter at the end of the stage, etc. There's 260 total ones in the game. For health and time you get to see your best result as well as the bracket you fell into. All these contribute points to the total Jojo ability which fills up to unlock extra content. Health and time being worth up to 15 points and special actions being worth up to 10 points. Thankfully, for completion's sake, you don't need to get all of them in one fight to get all of the points. The last section, which is worth another 10 points, is Secret Factor, though it doesn't play as big of a role as it did in the Golden Wind game. Similarly though, you need to perform something that mimics the anime. Unfortunately, you won't know you got it right until after the stage ends, as there is no benefit or indication to getting it. They attract separately on your save file, but it's just extra points. In this stage, you need to end the match on the right side of the screen, so that Jotaro is outside the cell. This is a reference to how Avdol only agreed to get Jotaro out of the cell and nothing more. These are kinda cool, but trying to unlock them without a guide is a nightmare, as you don't really get any hints, and even with guides, some of them were just really difficult, or the guides I were using were straight up wrong. And with all that out of the way, we can continue the story. Grandpa Joseph tells us all about how Dio is back, and we move on to our battle with Kakyoin at school. Jotaro cannot contain how disgusted he is with Kakyoin's stand, and proceeds to dish out insults at it before the fight even starts. The story mode is not all that difficult, especially at the beginning, so the fights shouldn't pose any trouble. For the secret factor, you need to win with a super aura barrage attack, which is done with quarter circle forward and two attack buttons. Jotaro performs surgery on a Kakyoin, freeing him from Dio's control. With his free will, he gets one look at Jotaro's mom, and he pledges his life to join the ragtag group of stand users so they can defeat Dio. Getting on the plane, we get our first unique stage of the game. The first two fights were very similar to what you get in the regular arcade game, but this level is unique to the PS1 version. You fight this big little bug which is Tower of Grey. He isn't playable normally and this acts as a sort of a boss battle. He can be quite annoying to fight as he is small and super fast, but thankfully Kakyoin is one of the strongest characters in the game. He's got quite the range with his normal attacks, thanks to his stand, and even can perform Emerald Splash to get enemies from a distance. In addition to being able to lay traps. He is also one of the few characters that can control his stand remotely. By pressing forward and two attack buttons, his stand will detach and you will control it directly. You can also perform it by doing a quarter circle forward and pressing the stand button. Your stand will summon itself with an attack before you gain control of it. For the secret factor in this stage, you need to win using Kakyoin's special India's arm attack, which can be performed with a quarter circle back and two attack buttons. After dispatching the old man, who was the enemy stand user, Joseph safely lands the plane in Hong Kong, where we meet Guile. I mean Polnareff who is being controlled by Dio. Avdol takes this fight, which is one of my favorite characters to play as. He has a range of pretty wide attacks and several projectiles. Just like Kakyoin, he is able to remotely control his stand. For the secret factor, you need to win the fight with a crossfire hurricane special, which is done with a quarter circle back and two attack buttons. We get rid of Polnareff's brain bug and he joins us thinking this way he'll be able to encounter the man who killed his sister. We make it to chapter 5 and get another PS1 exclusive. Unfortunately, not the best one. The gang is on a ship to Singapore when a stowaway is found in the waters. Jotaro goes to save her but is attacked by the stand Dark Blue Moon. It goes for the attack and you have to press a direction that lights up to avoid it. Yep, we have quick time events and pretty tight ones too. This type of minigame appears a few times in this game but I do appreciate them trying to do something to include fights that would have otherwise have to be omitted. Of course they couldn't make every character playable so this is at least something. And these sections are all voiced so you get that. Failing one just does some damage to you and you can try again, this only really lowers your rating at the end. 
Sometimes they are predetermined, which makes it easier, and they can be either two or three different directions you have to press. We get two more quick time events in this stage, and for the secret factor, you just need to make sure you get them all first try. Don't worry if you can't, you can replay any level after finishing the story mode. After finishing this section, the gang gets onto another ship and we get another new minigame. This one is a lot more fun. It's essentially a shooter where you move the crosshair with the d-pad and shoot with square or circle. You need to deplete the monkey's health bar and avoid shooting the girl that appears sometimes. The monkey will throw things at you that you have to shoot down too. I much prefer this to the quick time events, but this is the only section like this. For the secret factor, you just need to make sure you don't shoot the girl at any point. We beat the monkey, which reveals that the whole ship was his stand, and the gang gets away on the boat they came from. They finally make it to Singapore, where Polnareff gets some unexpected room service. The vibes are just completely off, and we have our next fight against Devo, or Dobo as he's called here, and his stand Ebony Devil, which is a puppet that he can move separately. Polnareff has a few charge moves, which involve holding a direction, then pressing the opposite one with the attack button. They're a bit more awkward to perform than the normal quarter circle inputs if you're not used to them, as it's hard to tell how long you need to hold one direction for. By mashing an attack button, he will do the million splits attack, which this game calls the million pricks. You need to finish the opponent with this move to get the secret factor. Next up is Jotaro vs Rubber Kakuin, who they named Rubber Soul here. Another standard fight. Rubber Soul is one of the characters that doesn't have a stand gauge. These characters are at a natural disadvantage, as having your standout eliminates the chip damage you get while blocking hits. For the secret factor here, he needs to use his Rero Rero Taunt at some point, which he will do randomly. <laughs> After the fight, he tells us of other stand users who are hunting for us, and then tries to attack Jotaro, who retaliates with the absolute classic move of Ora Ora, Dong Bong Bong Bong, Dong Dong. Moving on to an entire horse. Polnareff asks him about the guy he's looking for, and whole horse responds with, Gun. Polnareff laughs, whole horse laughs, the gun laughs, Abdul laughed so hard he even died. It's revealed Jay Gale, the man who Polnareff was looking for, is with Whole Horse, and we start the next fight. We are mainly fighting against Whole Horse, but some of his attacks do involve Jay Gale's Hanged Man's abilities, especially his super moves. To get a secret factor in this fight, you need to win on a timeout, which is easier said than done. As you may possibly be aware, Whole Horse has a gun, and is generally a zoner character, meaning trying to keep both yourself and Whole Horse alive for the entirety of the 99 seconds can be pretty rough. Also, making sure you have more health than him at the end. He doesn't have a stand gauge himself, so he will always take chip damage, meanwhile you need to be careful of not getting your stand crushed. I tried to get some weak hits in to waste some time, and after a lot of struggle, I was finally able to do it. Paul Horse runs away, and Polnareff finally gets his revenge. The next two chapters consist of quick time events. First you have the Empress fight, which infects Joseph's arms, you need to perform 4 different QTEs here. Afterwards you have a fight against the Wheel of Fortune car, where you get another 4 QTEs. As always with these types of stages, the secret factors are unlocked by clearing them without failing a single quick time event. Chapter 12 has a bit more of an interesting minigame that is unique to the PS1 version. We have to defeat a set of 30 random zombie enemies as Jotaro, but you have a more simplified control scheme where you cannot perform throws or guard, and your X button now will just perform a special move. There are three different types of zombies, the slow walking ones in yellow, the babies and the red jumping ones. It's pretty easy however, as you can just mash the X button to get rid of all the enemies quickly. For the special factor here, you apparently need to clear the stage with a high enough score. I don't see a way to know what is your actual score. It seems that defeating enemies without getting hit gives you more points though, which shouldn't be hard by just mashing X. After defeating 30 zombies, Enya will join the fight and you will need to deplete her health to finish the stage. She only uses her stand to attack, which is quite slow and you can interrupt her easily. Just be careful of the other enemies still spawning, which can be used to increase your score too I guess for the secret factor. Chapter 13 is yet another new minigame exclusive to the PS1. Joseph is just trying to watch some TV when Kakuin and Polnareff shrink their stands to invade his body to eliminate the lover's stand that is hiding inside of him. You get to play a shoot em up style stage where you can control both Hierophant Green and Silver Chariot. The D-pad moves your character, which you can adjust the speed of by pressing L1 to go faster or slow down with L2. Square slash circle does a standard shot, while triangle and X can be used to shoot out Silver Chariot in whatever direction you moved last, which will attack the enemies for a while. Both of those moves can be upgraded by collecting those power-ups, which will increase the spread of your normal shots and make Silver Chariot attack for longer. R1 and L2 can be used to create a Mystic Trap. If you make a close shape, it will stay on the screen and any enemy that touches it will get hurt. You can only have a certain amount of them at one time, and putting too many will break whichever was created first. Silver Chariot will also block bullets if he's in front of them and not attacking. This is a pretty fun stage in itself, although the only one like this as they didn't make any more levels. The secret factor in here is known to be a cause of a lot of issues for players, and even seen some guides get it not quite right. It's once again connected to these invisible points. In a separate mode, you can play the stage that actually has the score counter, which is a lot nicer, but for some reason, they don't give you one here. You get awarded points for how many enemies you defeat, how much health you have left, and time taken, which mainly means taking bosses as quickly as you can, since it's an auto-scroller otherwise. 
You want to leave the spawner enemies alive for as long as you can so you can get the extra points and spam Mystic Trap to catch any enemies you may have missed. I've also had a lot of trouble getting the necessary points here and randomly, after enough tries, I finally got it. The final boss here has these tentacle tubes that you need to destroy to be able to damage the main body. They will come back after a while though. Overall, fun stage, but an annoying secret factor. They also call Steely Dan S. Terry Dan due to localization. Chapter 14 once again has a new minigame for us. This time the group is attacked by the weird pesky burning ball in the sky and we have to play Where's Waldo to find the area that is shown in the screen mirror. You have to aim at the location that's shown in the corner and press either square or circle to throw a rock. Note that the image shown in the hint mirror is well mirrored. You have to get him 4 times to finish the stage and throwing a rock at the wrong place will increase the temperature gauge at the top which acts as your health bar. You can also zoom in with R1 and zoom out with R2. It's pretty easy and you get 150 seconds to complete it but if you want to go for the secret factor you will need to finish the stage before the timer hits 120 giving you 30 seconds which is a bit trickier but it's a simple enough image to not be too bad. Also I didn't know this on until now, but the stand user of the sun is called Arabia Fats. Next up is Death 13. In JoJo's Venture and Heritage for the Future games, this is actually a secret boss in their respective story modes. If you play as one of the Joestar group members and win the first 5 stages without losing a round, you'll be able to fight him. For JoJo's Venture in this game's arcade mode, you also need to finish every round with a super move in addition to the first condition. In the super story mode, you play as Kakuin who activated his stand before entering the dream world the rest of the Joestar group is stuck in, allowing him to use it in battle. As Death 13 is not a normally playable character, this is more similar to the Tower of Grey fight. His side can be pretty scary but has fairly simple patterns meaning it shouldn't cause you too much trouble. The secret factor here also causes a little confusion as I've heard that you only need to do your stand appearance attack by putting quarter circle forward and the stand button but others say you need to finish the fight with it. In my experience it was the latter as just making it appear didn't trigger it for me. In chapter 16, Polnareff finds a magic lamp and wishes to bring back his sister and Avdol back to life. Unsurprisingly, the genie was a stand and the reanimated corpses attack Polnareff when the real Avdol shows up alive and well. I guess he finished laughing. This is another stage similar to the Jotaro vs Enya fight where you have a more simplified control scheme with X just performing a special move. You fight against the stand Judgment and two corpses though you only need to beat Judgment to proceed. The corpses can be annoying by getting in the way and if you want the secret factor, you will need to defeat a few of them before finishing of Judgment to trigger it. Around 3 or 4 seem to give you enough points. Avdol is quite strong so it shouldn't pose too much issue and mashing X works wonders in this stage too. Avdol and Polnareff find the stand user hiding on the ground and start dropping things in his breathing tube to mess with him before retiring another one of Dio's henchmen. After all this hard work, the boys are having a nice cuppa, but uh-oh, silly Kakyoin getting old for his teenage years accidentally made six cups even though there's only five of them. The six cup turns out to be a stand, and we get into our next fight against the high priestess stand user, Midler. This part of the story has been quite heavily altered from the manga, as the battle takes place on land instead of the gang being in a submarine. She also gets an updated design created by Araki, which would become her canon look as she didn't get much in the original manga. I really love how these games expand on the part they cover. By focusing on a single part instead of trying to combine all of JoJo's into one, they are able to focus on exploring parts of the story the manga may have omitted. And I wish they made more games like this. Like, imagine a part 4 game that explores the identity of the man who saved Josuke. Anyway, this is another standard fight. Middler likes to block a lot, but that is actually quite good because to get the secret factor for this stage, you need to win the fight with a stand crush, which can be quite tricky to do. I was able to get lucky, and using Starfinger, I somehow broke her stand from almost full gauge. In chapter 18, Iggy joins the group, and with that, we have run out of tarot cards, so we are attacked by the Egyptian god card owner Ndul and his stand Geb. This is another new minigame, however, this one is actually featured in the arcade versions. You have to run across the stage dodging Ndul's water attacks. I recommend having you stand out at all times so you can double jump, making it easier to avoid all the projectiles. It's a pretty simple stage, and once you get to Ndul, he will go down in just one hit. For the secret factor, you need to finish him with a quarter circle forward punch barrage super move. While the group is in the hospital, we get to meet the legendary Oingo and Boingo brothers, or Oing and Boing as they are called here. This is another stage with just free quick time events, but the whole thing is done in the art style of Boingo's book, which is really neat. The secret factor is as always to get them all correct without failing once. And in the end, the renowned Oingo Boingo brothers take care of themselves before the Joestar group even learns of their existence. Next up, Polnareff encounters Chaka, who has been possessed by the Anubis stand, and we get a break from the minigames to have some proper battles for a while. I could feel the difficulty going up at this point. I had to mash a little less as Chaka has a counter move which lets him learn moves. This allows him to act out of blocks and learn attacks to punish you. For the secret factor, you need to finish the fight with a quarter circle back last shot super attack. With Chaka defeated, the Anubis sword possesses Khan, who fights Jotaro. As a sword 
user, he has the ability to counter just like Chaka, but overall this is an easier fight in my opinion. The worst thing about it being Khan's posture. For the secret factor, you need to do a guard cancel, which is done with a quarter circle forward and attack button when blocking. With Khan defeated, Polnareff gets possessed by Anubis and becomes Black Polnareff? So Polnareff Requiem is a bit more of a challenge. He can counter and learn moves just like the other two, but he loses his stand gauge in the process. His sword is shorter, but his attacks do utilize his stand despite not being able to summon it normally. For the secret factor, you will need him to counter your punch barrage move. It can be either the special or super version of it. He likes to counter a lot, so it shouldn't be too hard to do by just spamming the special attack. It's at this point we come to a split in the path. In the story, the group splits up and has their own fights which happen at the same time, but they try to recreate by having this split. But I don't really see a point of it. After you beat the game, you can go back to see the other path with the chapter select, and I would have preferred to just have the story progress through both scenarios one after the other. Anyway, let's start with Joseph and Abdul who encounter Maria, or as this game calls her, Maharachya. We get to finally properly play as old Joseph, who fights using a combination of his stand and Hamon. You can even grab enemies with Hermit Purple and send Hamon through it with quarter circle forward attack then continuing to mash the attack button. Maria has a lot of annoying attacks though, from setting up these traps and an electrified cable to just throwing random metal things that target you. For the secret factor, you need to get hit by her magnetism attack at least 7 times, which are these plugs she spawns. This one is definitely a lot trickier, making you move into the correct attack and having enough health to take her down afterwards. After beating her, you would go to chapter 20 25, but let's see what happens in the other choice. If you pick Jotaro and Polnareff's path, you would encounter Alessi who has one of the most interesting mechanics in the whole game. The developers did a great job trying to incorporate all the abilities of the characters from the manga into interesting game mechanics, but this one goes above and beyond in terms of effort and fan service. For those who may not remember, Alessi's power is to DH people essentially and turn them into children so he can defeat them more easily. Similarly here, some of his attacks will transform characters for a few seconds into versions that are significantly weaker. Alessi himself will improve his posture and have some of his attacks change. For most characters, they just turn into a child version of themselves, which is already cool that they put all that effort into making new sprites for everyone, but some characters will turn into different things, such as Dio turning into Nukesaku, or Shadow Dio turning into Wong with Dio's head, Whole Horse will turn into Boingo, Pet Shop turns into an egg, Yellow Temperance into a fat lady, Maria into the grandma, Old Joseph turns into Young Joseph from part 2, which is actually a secret playable character in the game, named just Jojo. And if he is hit by the de-aging beam, he turns into Joseph from the airplane flashback in part 2. And then you have Iggy, whose face just turns into this look. There is more, but let's get back to the story. In this stage you play as Polnareff, and for the secret factor you have to get turned into a kid at least one time. After winning the fight, Jotaro joins in and they get rid of Alessi for good. Moving on to the gang's encounter with Daniel J. Darby. It's Kaiji all over again with three different gambling minigames. For the first one you have to pick which piece of the meat the cat will go for first, either left or right. Apparently there is a small chance you can win here, but usually the cat will go for the other piece first. I've tried it a few times here and not managed to win, but the same minigame gets unlocked somewhere else where I was able to win, just never in the story. If you do win, the stage ends here and you unlock another secret factor, otherwise Polnareff's soul gets taken away and you move on to the second game which is dropping coins into a cup of water. First you select how many coins you want to drop in, from 1 to 5, each one being equal to one line on the fill bar. If you go over it, you lose. Then you have to press either square or circle to stop the two triangles as close to each other as possible. The further away they are, the more splash there will be. The splash will briefly make the water level go higher than the amount of coins drop, and even if that goes over the overflow line, you lose. Stopping the triangles close will drop them without making any splash. There is one more mechanic which is cheating by stopping the triangles and dropping the coin using the triangle button instead. This will decrease the overflow line by 1 and you can do it up to 3 times. The marker on the screen is just the initial overflow limit and the changes done by cheating aren't reflected, making it more of a gamble. I have to say, I really like how this minigame was implemented. It has genuinely interesting mechanics and I haven't noticed one, but I think it would be great if it had a 2 player mode. Anyway, if you do win, the stage will end early and you will receive a secret factor. If you lose, which isn't too hard, Joseph's soul will get taken away and we move on to the third and final game, which is poker. Kind of. The cards are only from 10 to aces, plus jokers. You start with 12 coins and you can bet up to 5 in each game. You get 5 cards, then you can either call, drop to fold, or raise which will allow you to swap some cards. Besides that, the better hand wins. The first time I played this, I was running out of coins and had an option to bluff up here, but wanting to try and win myself, I ended up just losing. On my second attempt, I was doing a lot better and had the game drag on for a while without the option appearing again. Eventually, Jotaro just started doing the bluff by himself unprompted. Jotaro bets the soul of every person he can possibly remember without looking at his cards, and the thought of Star Platinum helping Jotaro cheat turns Darby into a total coomer. <laughs> Winning by bluffing here also seems to trigger the secret factor, so this is a pretty easy one. 
After that, the gang finally makes it to Cairo, where Dio is hiding. The first opponent here is an entire red horse with Boingo, which is an alternate version of the original character with different moves. This stage has another really nasty secret factor, which requires you to win without getting hit by even a single bullet. Whole horse being literally the man with gun, and having more than one move that utilizes said gun, makes this not a very fun secret factor. I assume blocking with your stand should be fine as that negates all damage, but you kinda just have to be more aggressive and get lucky to get it. After defeating whole horse, Iggy sends Bongo to meet his brother, and moves on to fight with the infamous pet shop. For a long time, Pet Shop has been known as an unbalanced menace that was banned due to its power. And you can definitely see some reasons why. He's annoying to fight just by the fact he is small and can fly around, making it difficult to hit him, and he's got a lot of strong attacks himself, being able to summon icicles from just anywhere. Thankfully, this is just a story mode AI we're up against, so it's not too bad, and the secret factor here requires you to block at least 10 times, which is simple and something you'll be doing already anyway. With Pet Shop down, Iggy now also wants to get revenge on Dio and rejoins the group. Speaking of Iggy, I had this image pop up of him so often on the loading screens, it's insane. I hate it. It looks like he's literally chewing shit. Those eyes just stare into your soul. It's horrible. Let's move on. The gang approaches Dio's mansion and we have another split in the story. Let's start with Polnareff, Avdol and Iggy who go up against Kenny G. This is another minigame just like the one in the fight with the Sun Stand user, though this time the image is a lot harder to scan through. Once again you have to find the area shown in the smaller square. Although it's not mirrored this time, it does move around a lot more and you need to hit the area it is showing at the time. Your attempts are represented by the Iggy icons and you have the ability to use Magician Red's flames to point you to where the enemy is hiding by pressing triangle. This can be done up to 3 times and you need to find him a total of 4 times to progress. For the secret factor, you need to complete the stage within 40 seconds. Immediately after that stage, they are attacked by Vanilla Ice who reduces Avdol to a pair of arms and we have to fight him as Polnareff. In the arcade version story modes, he can feature as a boss, giving you time to essentially do one combo before doing some unblockable attack, though here you just fight him as a normal character. He can still be quite scary though. First of all, he is huge and has a wide reach which only increases as he turns on his stand which covers him like a suit. He can hide inside of his stand and has some unblockable super moves that you just have to avoid, but overall it's probably easier than the arcade boss version. For the secret fact, you need to finish the fight with a throw, which you do by pressing forward and strong attack when close to the opponent. After winning the fight, Iggy sacrifices himself and Polnareff is able to finish Vanilla Ice for good. Meanwhile, while Polnareff is grieving his lost friends, in the other path, Kakyoin and friends play video games against Talents T. Darby. Half the gang gets challenged to a race which Kakyoin accepts. This path is arguably worse than the other one as it's purely quick time events. Some of them, like the six corners, seem to be predetermined, having to press the same direction as the turn, but others are random. There are seven QTEs here, the six corners and the entry to the tunnel, after which Kakuin pushes Darby closer to the finish line and loses himself. Jotaro challenges him next to a baseball game. Oh, that's a baseball! Here you have another 7 QTEs making for a total of 14 quick time events, which are pretty tight, that you need to get in the same health bar. If it reaches zero, it's all the way back to the beginning of the racing game. The secret factor, as always, requires you to get them all in one go without failing, which is also crazy. After giving Darby the Aura Aura treatment, we reunite with Polnareff. Having one of Dio's henchmen, Nukesaku, lead us to the coffin, we find the dead Nukesaku himself in the coffin, once open, which leads us to the final split path. Going with Kakuin and Joseph leads us to a fight against Dio as Kakuin. Dio is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Having reached the final stages of the game, the AI is also a lot more aggressive, and the fights ahead will be tougher, but you will basically just be fighting him several times with different characters. Dio loves to have his stand out, making it hard to get in hit sometimes, and he likes to attack a lot. He can throw knives at you, drop steamrollers, stop time, and more. The worst thing about this stage though is the secret factor. You need to win the fight with a quarter circle back Hierophant Barrier attack, which is more of a trap that deals incredibly little damage, and it needs to be the attack itself that finishes him off. Dio may be scary, but Kakuin has his own incredible range, so we are able to beat him, but Kakuin not being allowed to have a happy ending, gets the donut experience and uses the last of his powers to send a message revealing Dio's stand has the power to stop time. Next up you have to fight Dio as Joseph, a much worse matchup, but as we are fighting an AI still, with the power of coward this, we can beat him too. The secret factor here requires you to win the fight by using the quarter circle forward hermit web special, after which you can continue pressing the attack button to send Hamon through it. Definitely a lot easier to get than the previous level. After this, it's the final stage, but let's go back to see the other path. Selecting the bottom option has Jotaro squaring off of Dio. You can really notice in this battle how big Dio's stand the world is. Star Planum and Jotaro himself even look tiny in comparison. 
The secret factor in this level requires you to get a stand clash against Dio. I haven't mentioned it yet as it's very rare and most characters can't do it, but moves like Star Platinum and the world's quarter circle forward punch barrage attacks can clash like they do in all-star battle. If it does happen, you have to mash the attack button to win the clash and deal damage to the opponent. You kind of have to get lucky for it to happen. Sometimes he does the move for quite a long time so you may be able to react in time and get in the clash that way, but I just spammed it until I got lucky. Defeating Dio here has us fight him again but as Polnareff this time. I definitely found this fight a lot harder, not being used to Polnareff as much and not being a fan of his hold inputs. The secret factor here requires you to finish Dio with a shooting star move, which can be done by holding down then pressing up and attack. If you stand off, Silver Chariot will attach to a wall until you let go after which he will hold on to the opponent, and with the stand on, Polnareff will go along with it. I use the stand on version which is a lot more risky but I assume either is fine. Polnareff buys enough time for Jotaro to strike Dio, who unfortunately escapes and drains Joseph of his blood to recover his strength. Once again bringing us to the final chapter with Jotaro vs Dio. It's similar to the fight you did two chapters ago but this time he can use his proper time stop ability. As you may have noticed, you start the chapter with three bars of super instead of the usual one and that is tied to the secret factor of this stage as well as Jotaro's final ability I mentioned all the way at the beginning. Star Platinum being the same type of stand as the world apparently, also has the ability to stop time, which you can do by having at least 3 bars of super and inputting forward, medium attack, light attack, forward and stand button. This will completely stop the opponent and start draining your super bar, but you can just walk up and attack the enemy at that time, including performing special moves. The damage will then be applied when the time resumes. For the secret factor in this stage, you need to use your time stop ability during Dio's own time stop and defeat him before time resumes. This is an incredibly annoying secret factor because it completely depends on whether Dio wants to use his time stop ability or not, which I've had several attempts where he just refused to do it and would just use his normal level once. On top of that, you have to defeat him within the stop's time, so if he does it too early before you're able to get enough damage in, you might not be able to do it, or just mess up because of the pressure and not deal enough damage. There's not much I can say here to help, but he will pretty much always do the time stop after he does the taunt, so at least you're ready for it then. I recommend not using your supers until you stop time, and strongly recommend the quarter circle back super to finish him off, as it does a lot of damage. While it's an incredibly cool secret factor and a special moment, it was awful to try and get and almost made me want to give up on getting them all. In the end, we defeat Dio once and for all, Joseph is brought back with Dio's blood, whose body is then left out to sizzle in the sun. Jotaro and Joseph say their goodbyes to Polnareff and return back to Japan with Holly having recovered from her overgrown garden disease. Credits, congratulations, and game over. But is it? Because we still have a lot to cover. So let's get back into the super story mode which now has two options. Starting with results. It's a pretty self-explanatory screen that shows you all the levels, the ranks you've gotten, how many different special bonuses you've achieved, secret factors unlocked, and how many story levels you've completed. As you can see here, I still have to go through the other paths of the story, and there are even some more levels unlocked now. The other option is Journey, which shows you a similar flowchart where you can see a rank and even an icon to signify if you unlock the secret factor for the stage. You cannot directly select the split paths you missed until you play the level itself, so you need to play and beat the stage before it to get the option to go with another path. Moving on to the four extra missions they have sprinkled in, they're all fights against Shadow Dio, most of them being flashbacks to how some of the Joestar group members met Dio for the first time. As they're intended to be played after finishing the game, these fights definitely feel harder. To quickly go through these, the first fight is chapter 36 with Avdol against Shadow Dio, and they already want you to suffer with the first secret factor requiring you to win with a timeout. If you thought the whole horse one was bad almost 30 chapters ago, you can imagine how annoying this one is. Chapter 37 is Kakyoin's fight with Dio, which is a lot kinder and only requires you to get hit with his charisma super attack, which represents how they were infected with the brain bug. And if he does perform it, it's easy to get hit as you can't block it, but again, you are at the mercy of RNG whether he does use it or not. Chapter 38 is Polnareff who has the exact same secret factor requirement. And lastly, Chapter 39 is Whole Horse vs Shadow Dio. It's the original version of Whole Horse without Boingo, but since at this point of the story his partner Jay Gale has already been eliminated, he doesn't have access to all of his attacks, like the supers that involve Hang Man. For the secret factor, you need to attack Shadow Dio when he starts reading his book. This is actually a counter teleport he has, but once again, you are at the whim of the RNG whether he does it, and then you also need to be attacking him at that point, adding to the random chance. Nowhere near as bad as the Abdul requirement though. And finally, we have come to the end of the Super Story Mode, having completed all missions and gotten all the secret factors. You can now replay the stages to get better ranks and more Jojo points to unlock all the extras. Thankfully, you do not need to get 50 points on every single stage, as you will unlock everything at 1799 points, with the max being 1950. There is still more this game has, so let's continue down the main menu since we finished Super Story Mode. Next up is Arcade Mode, which is similar to the Arcade's version Story Mode. 
You get a cutscene at the beginning setting up the story for the character you've chosen, then do a series of fights which concludes with an ending cutscene, usually featuring an interesting what-if scenario. Jotaro's story is pretty much the same, with cutscenes being reused from the Super Story. Most of the ones for the Joestar group involve them just beating Dio and getting away alive. Except for Kakyuin, who dies like he does in the main story. It's okay, that's just new Kakyuin. Normal Kakyuin's ending has him survive the fight with Dio and go on the plane back home. Where he dies anyway. Really, they couldn't even give us that. Iggy, on the other hand, becomes Emperor of Dogs and gets a girlfriend. Some of them even have two endings where you pick a card and get different dialogue depending on which one was selected. I won't go through all of them, but they're all interesting in their own right. By the way, to access the hidden characters, you need to go either left from Jotaro or right from Dio to cycle through them once you have them unlocked. Back to the main menu, we have Versus mode, which is just the two-player mode that becomes available if a second controller is plugged in. Training, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. I do like the attention to detail of how you can only play specific stages as Dio, since he can be out in the sun as a vampire. Gallery mode is where things get more interesting again, as there's lots of things on offer here. First are the close-up graphics, which is a collection of the cut-in images you see during battles. Illustrations feature several pieces of artwork done by Araki related to the game, including Midler's design and an incredibly caked-up Jotaro. Rare item is the final reward you get from the Jojo points, which is two smaller pieces of art done by Araki, that have been signed by him too. Archive contains a whole new menu, where you get stage designs containing artwork of all the stages in the game, including a stage for the Sun fight, which was never used in the actual game, meaning they originally had other plans for his encounter most likely. Character designs has original line drawings for what will become some of the sprites for the game. Ndul seem to have a lot more animations, also hinting that they may have more planned for him than just sitting at the end of the stage. Musical scores contains actual music sheets for Jotaro's, Kakuin's and Polnareff's themes. I don't think I've ever seen something like that as an extra in the game, but even though I won't make any use of it, it's still really cool. And finally we have the secret file, which contains scans of the secret files booklet that featured this Jojo game. These are from a genuine series of 12-page booklets that Capcom released 28 volumes of between 1994 and 1999. This issue expands on some of the stuff that was shown in the archives menu, and it's incredibly cool to be able to flip through it. Last thing I'll mention is that if you stay on the gallery screen without picking anything for a while, you'll start hearing sounds of Jotaro and Dio fighting. This is all for the gallery. It's really great stuff. Last but not least, we have Book. This is Boingo's book, which has some extra stuff we can do. It's all very on brand with Boingo's art style too. First we have the endings. Every time you beat the arcade mode with a character, you'll be able to re-watch their ending cutscene here, which is nice for ones that have multiple outcomes. A few pages down we have the minigames. The top three are the Darby gambling games, then the Sun minigame, Monkey Shooter, the Lover Shmup section, which actually has a point counter, and the Kenny G minigame. They're all here in case you want to replay them without the story mode cutscenes. On the next page, you have a fight against Pet Shop, which you can play as different members of the Joestar group. I don't know why this fight is here, as I assumed it was just a normal fight in the story, not a boss fight, and Pet Shop is already a playable character, but I digress. Then you have the Enya section with the 30 zombies and the Judgment fight, and finally the Nduul, Death 13, and Tower of Grey boss fights, all of which can be played with any of the Joestar crew. The last page contains a sound test with the game soundtrack and voice clips. They even included some unused assets, and on your left you have tarot cards, which will predict your future. You press X and you get a random tarot card, although weirdly the Egyptian cards are also included here. The card will then rank your future's love life, money life and job life out of 3 stars and give you some words of wisdom. It's just a silly random thing they tacked on at the end, but it's at least on brand. The final thing I want to mention is the pocket station connectivity this game had. If you've never heard of the pocket station, it's a Sony peripheral that was created in response to the Dreamcast visual memory unit. It only came out in Japan, but the idea was you would connect it through the memory card slot and download software on it from compatible PS1 games that you could play anywhere. You would be able to get mini games or interact with the PS1 games in new ways. For this game you can download Pocket Jojo or Jojo Poke which features some basic mini games. You have a snake-like game where you control Hierophant's Green's arm to collect gems in order, a memory game with tarot cards, this weird one where you have to align the arrow and reticule to crush a stand with Star Platinum, the follow the card shell game with Iggy, this rhythm game where you have to stab circles in time with the music playing, a top-down runner game with Joseph, there even is an adventure mode where you progress through the map from Japan to Cairo in real time, and occasionally get challenged to one of the minigames, which unlocks the portrait of whoever challenged you if you win, and puts you back to the start if you lose. Each time you complete the adventure mode, you can link the pocket station to the console to unlock one of the secret characters, though these can be just gotten through Jojo points. Lastly, you have a gallery mode where you can look at all the portraits you have unlocked in the adventure mode. 
And with that, I've gone over pretty much all this game has to offer, besides actually going through all the characters individually. Which, if at any point this game seemed interesting to you, I highly recommend giving it a shot and finding out where all these characters have to offer yourself. This is an incredible game and so are the arcade versions of it. If you're more interested in this as a fighting game, I would say go for the Heritage for the Future arcade version, but if you just want a well-crafted, fun single-player game that has a lot to offer, I'd say try this. Especially if you're a fan of JoJo, there is just so much to enjoy here. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed learning about this awesome PS1 game as much as I did. And if you did, leave a like. Let me know in the comments what you think of this game. Subscribe for more videos like this. And if you have any suggestions or games you'd like to see me cover, drop it in the comments. It's always great to see what hidden gems are hiding out there. Anyway, take care for now.